Strife is a whole nother level. Offense is like a little hangnail. Strife is what you get after the hangnail has festered and become infected. And now it's starting to really make you sick. That's why it's important to take care of these little offenses, little things. Little foxes spoil the vine. You hurt my feelings. Well, just stop all that. Don't even say, you hurt my feelings. Say to yourself, I got my feelings hurt. It's my responsibility. Amen. Amen. But now strife is defined as bickering, arguing, heated disagreement, and an angry undercurrent. And I think the part that's the most scary to me is the angry undercurrent, because that's when everybody kind of knows something's not right, but nobody's dealing with it. You can feel it in the atmosphere. You can feel it between a husband and wife. You can feel it between parents and their kids. You can feel it at work. You can even feel it in the church. Amen? And so today we're going to talk about three things that the Bible says causes strife. You see, a lot of times you can't get rid of the root until you deal with the fruit. And so we're going to kind of back into this message, first looking at how important it is to learn how to live in agreement. And in order to do that, we have to learn how to disagree agreeably. Amen? So we're going to look first at Matthew 18, 19. Again, I tell you, if two of you on earth agree harmonize together, make a symphony together about whatever, anything and everything that they might ask, it will come to pass and be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. Do we even begin to realize how powerful that is? God says, if I can find just two people that can get along <laughs> and get into agreement and really walk in love, the power of their prayers is ramped up to a whole nother level. And whatever they ask, I'll do it for them. My, my, my. Psalm 133, the entire psalm, which is only a few verses, so don't feel like you're going to faint. <laughs> Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Unity. Verse 2, it is like the precious ointment poured on the head that ran down on the beard, even the beard of Aaron, the first high priest, that came down upon the collar and the skirts of his garment, consecrating the whole body. Now, when they were anointed back in those days, they didn't just dab a little oil on them like we do today. They took a bottle and poured it on them. We had a guy at our office powerful man of God who deals with the underground church in China. Been in prison so many times. I mean, you, you could just tell. I mean, he's just got power all over him. And so I asked him to pray for me before he left, and he pulled out this big vial of oil, and I thought, uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> he looks like the real deal. <laughs> and I said to his assistant, because this guy didn't even speak English, so I thought I can't communicate with him. So I said to his assistant, I said, he's not going to pour that on my head, is he? <laughs> he said, no, no, no. So thankfully, he, he dabbed me too. But the point is, is they weren't into all that back then. You got anointed and it ran down your beard, your hair and all over and just covered your whole body. And uh, so this is saying that unity is like the anointing. I want you to get a hold of that. Some of you maybe don't really understand what the anointing is, but the anointing represents the presence and the power of God in your life. Amen? I do what I do by God's anointing. And let me tell you something. We all need to carry an anointing. You just don't need an anointing because you're in ministry. You need an anointing to raise kids. You certainly need an anointing to be married and stay married. Amen? 
And then the next verse says, it is like the dew of lofty Mount Hermon and the dew that comes on the hills of Zion. For there, they are where? They are where there's unity. <laughs> The Lord has commanded the blessing, even life forever, upon the high and the lowly. So, if you have unity, you're going to have anointing and you're going to have blessing. If there's unity in your home, you're going to have an anointed home and a blessed home. If there's unity in your church, you're going to have an anointed church and a blessed church. And people... I mean, some people may come to a church and stay there because there's a great speaker, but I tell you what, what people really want is the anointing, and they don't even really know what that is sometimes, but it's just like it makes everything good. Just makes everything good. And so, certainly, Satan works endlessly to do everything that he can to try to get everything full of strife the business full of strife, the marriage full of strife, the church full of strife, the worship team full of strife, the leadership team full of strife, the kids in strife, the school in strife. And I'll tell you what, in our world today, this is actually one of the hugest problems that we're dealing with. And so I'm gonna take that scripture and I'm gonna turn it around for you because this is exactly what it's saying. Where there is no unity, there will be no anointing and there will be no blessing. So we have to fight for unity. And I said the other night that when we started our ministry, God spoke three things to my heart. And I didn't know what I'm telling you now, so this was God giving me direction. He said, there's three things I want you to do, and if you do these things, I'll be able to bless you. Keep the strife out of your life was number one. <laughs> keep it out of your ministry. Keep it out of your home. Now, interestingly enough, he gave us the responsibility to do that. You can't just say, well, I wish we got along. That's not going to work. You got to find a way to get along. And usually that's going to mean that somebody's got to do some adjusting and some adapting. And I didn't want it to be me. And then he said, do what you do with excellence and be a person of integrity. We won't get into the other two, but it makes a great series of teachings. What is your home like? Do you participate in strife at your church? Strife manifests in criticism and judgment and a bad attitude toward things, a sulky spirit. In the home, it manifests in people avoiding each other, not, not talking to each other or screaming and yelling. And even if nobody's arguing and bickering, there's an angry undercurrent that everybody can feel. And it needs to change. And each one of us has to take the responsibility to do our part to make sure that it changes. At our ministry, we give everybody this message when they're hired. We let them know that we don't put up with strife. And if they won't get out of strife, we try to help them. We don't just, you know, kick people out the door. But if people, people don't need to be working for me if they don't like me. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> I mean, really, that's just true. I mean, you, you, you don't need to be going to a church if you don't like the pastor. I mean, how silly is that? And so I pray all the time that God will get rid of the people that are in my building that don't belong there and bring in the ones that do. I want the right people, not just people. I want the right people in my life. Because I tell you what, one person in strife that is not dealt with can actually spread so many problems that it can end up, and I'm not exaggerating because I've seen it happen, it can end up destroying a church. You know, there's a lot of great churches being built, but I've heard that there are more closing down than those that are being built. And a lot of the reason is this kind of nonsense right here. 
everybody's got an opinion and everybody wants to be right and everybody wants to be the boss and merciful day. So we have to learn how to disagree agreeably. So I'm going to say something and I, I hope that God just gives the anointing for you to catch this right away. I don't agree with Dave about all of his opinions and everything he thinks or necessarily even everything he does. But I do agree with Dave. I love him. He's a good man. I agree with his character. I agree with his principles. And see, to live in agreement doesn't necessarily mean that you agree with every person about all their ways. But it means that you can respect them and you can appreciate them. Okay, let's take an example like maybe the, all the denominational stuff. Now, you know, um, I mean, there's a lot of people like me, but there's a lot of people that don't think I should be doing what I'm doing. There, there's a lot of people who maybe think because I don't have a lot of formal education that I'm not qualified to do this and, you know, on and on and on. I mean, I've had a lot of really nice things said about me, but I've had a lot of really not so nice things said about me. And um, all I can say is uh, the proof is in the 40 years I've been doing it, so I won't even get into that. So, and uh, the Bible says you'll know them by their fruit, not by their doctrine. And a lot of the people that have criticized me for what I am doing aren't doing anything. So that's, that's really sad. But let's just say that you have yay and so church over here and uh, maybe they don't believe in, you know, any of the Pentecostal things. They think all the gifts of the Spirit went away with the church. You know, a lot of times we just make up stuff because we don't have it in our life and so we decide it's out because it's not my experience. And anyway, I dare not get into all that. It'd be too long. But um, so they decide that they're against me. They don't, they don't agree with me on, let's say, three points. Well, you know what? We can still love each other. You're, you're not going to find two people that are going to agree about everything. You just will not find two people. That are, you're not going to find a church where you like every single solitary thing that they do. You're not going to find a child that you like everything they do. You're not going to find somebody to be married to that you like everything that they do. But love can rise above that. And love can work to find places of agreement. Now, Dave and I are extremely different. Our personalities are different. I mean, you should, you should see us try to decorate a house together. It is like, well, we finally just gave that up. I said, Dave, please, please just let me do the house. <laughs> it's really important to me. Just let me do the house. You can go do something else you love to do. I won't say a thing, but let me do the house. So Dave plays all the golf he wants to, and I do all the decorating. <laughs> You're not ever going to get along with anybody if you think you have to control everything. So Find the things that are really important to you and stand for those. But then one of the ways to get to do that is if you then give that person a lot of the stuff that they like. It's called compromise. Amen? So I want to say it again. I don't have to agree with everybody's church doctrine, but I can appreciate the fruit of what people are doing. I can appreciate the years of hard work and the sacrifice that they've made to preach the gospel. Let's stop looking at what we don't agree with and start purposely finding things that we can't agree with. I don't agree with all of Dave's opinions, but I like the way he looks. Come on, find something. Amen? I like the fact that Dave gets up every morning and he cleans up and he shaves and he, he looks nice all the time. I like the fact that he's affectionate. I like that. Matter of fact, I told him, I said, you know, I'm, I'm pretty tired today and we got to go home 
pack and unpack some stuff and head back out again tomorrow for somewhere. And I said, uh, uh, we've got this big massager at home that's like a sander. Anybody ever seen one of those? Aren't those amazing? Well, my chiropractor uses it on me, but he's been telling me, you need to teach Dave how to use this, which I've never done. But I said, will you, will you use that massager on me when we get home today? And he said, yeah, I'll do it for 30 seconds. Well, I think he's up now to about a minute or two. So Dave is going to actually give me a massage with that sander when I get home. I love Dave for that. I'm in agreement with that. Do you understand what I mean when I say that we don't have to agree with everything a person feels, thinks, or decides, but we can agree with them? Let's get beyond what people do to the person they are. Half the time, we get so caught up in not liking what somebody does, and we never get beyond that. So we never really even find out who the person really is or how wonderful they are. I don't like your hair, so you're out. <laughs> and here's another thing. Now, this is going to be good. Are you ready? Ask the person next to you, are you ready? Okay, here it comes. I don't even have to try to change Dave's mind when I don't think like he does. <laughs> Some are going like... Okay, let me give you an example. Dave and I don't fight much anymore. I mean, every once in a while we'll have a little tiff, but I mean, it's very, very rare. And if we do, it lasts about five minutes because neither one of us will put up with it. But in the beginning, I mean, we had a lot of strife. And um, it was mostly me because Dave was pretty peaceful, but he is very opinionated. And I'm very opinionated. And so that could sometimes be a problem. So in the earlier years of our marriage, Dave and I would start trying to discuss something we didn't agree on, and the next thing I knew, we were in this huge fight, and honestly, I would get so confused, I didn't even know what happened. Do you ever have conversations like that? I mean, I'm like, wait a minute. We were trying to talk about what color to paint a room, and then the next thing I know, I'm dragging up everything from day one when we got married, and... And then I end with, we just can't talk about anything. <laughs> we just can't communicate. And he would just be like, what do you mean we can't talk about anything? We talk about stuff all the time. And then I would say, don't yell at me. He'd say, well, you're yelling at me. I'm at, <laughs> you got it? And I honestly did not know what was wrong because I was far enough along in the Lord that I didn't want to fight like that. I didn't want to be like that. And so I really started asking God to show me what the problem was, and he did. I had a root of rejection in my life from my childhood. I want you to listen, because this is going to put some people over the top. And so, because I felt rejected, I didn't know how to separate my opinions and my ideas from who I was. And so, when somebody didn't think like I did, the only thing I knew to do was try to change their mind, because if I could get them to agree with me, then I felt like I was okay. But if they didn't agree with me, then I couldn't go away feeling like I was okay. Then I felt like I was being rejected. And what God showed me is just because Dave doesn't agree with your opinion, that doesn't mean he doesn't agree with you. Just because he doesn't love your idea, that doesn't mean he doesn't love you. Is anybody understanding what I'm talking about? And so you have to give people the freedom to have their own opinions, and I'm not saying you can't discuss something, but you know, if, if it's obvious you try once to change somebody's mind and they're digging in deeper, then you might as well just zip it and go on and have a peaceful day because it's not going to work. Now, you may prefer to keep arguing. I don't know, but I can't do that anymore. I just can't do it. And I've learned that it's better for me to just shut up, not have to have the last word, 
How many of you are really addicted to having to have the last word? And here we go. This is a really big one. Here is a sentence that's going to maybe save your marriage. I think I'm right, but I may be wrong. Isn't that anointed? Instead of, well, you're wrong, and I'm right, and you never listen to me. <laughs> you know what, honey? I think I'm right, but I may be wrong. It's like, I'm still trying to get him to say that a little bit more to me. We're still working on that part. Matter of fact, when we were driving here, I think it was Thursday night, or maybe we were coming from the airport Thursday, I don't know. In one car ride, Dave said, oh, I was wrong about that. And in the same car ride, he said, you know, you're right about that. I thought, oh, Lord have mercy, Jesus is coming soon. I mean, just to say that I said it, ladies, how many of you are married to somebody that thinks they're always right about everything? Well, why don't you just let them think they are and be quiet? I mean, really? Is it that big of a deal? I mean, we used to get in these battles over which way to go to the hardware store. I mean, should, well, what are you going that way for? Well, it's the closest way. No, it's not. This way is closer. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right, I said last night, but I want to say this again. James 3.16 says, where there is strife, there is also jealousy, envy, contention, rivalry, and selfish ambition. Where, let me start again. For wherever there is jealousy, envy, and contention, rivalry, and selfish ambition, there will also be confusion, unrest, disharmony, rebellion, and all sorts of evil and vile practices. So let me just throw this out for you guys to think about. Mom and dad, if you have strife in the home between you, you can expect to have rebellious kids. Well, strife is a very dangerous thing. It's defined as anger, disagreement, heated disagreement, an angry undercurrent. And so often there's this angry undercurrent in our lives and everybody's got a smile on their face, but behind the scenes, nobody's getting along. The Bible calls us to unity. Where there's unity, there's blessing and anointing. And I wanna encourage you to learn how to keep strife out of your life.